Partway through a recent summer Mediterranean cruise, I was looking down the pool deck. It was packed with happy cruisers having a great time, but it struck me I was on the wrong cruise line. As a solo cruiser, I should have avoided this particular one. Not only was it costing me the same as the couple in the cabin next to me, but I was also feeling rather kind of left out despite the throngs of happy people that were all around me on the cruise. Welcome aboard, I'm Gary Bembridge. 18 of my last 20 cruises have been solo. And after that experience, I took a step backwards and I want to share with you what I realized makes for a much better solo cruise experience. First off, I realized I must focus my plans back on lines that are more interested in us, as they also tend to offer more solo cabins, lower supplement deals, and a better solo onboard experience. Now, one follower of the channel, Peter, actually put this rather nicely by suggesting there are three types of cruise lines. First, those who actively appreciate, encourage, and embrace us as solo cruisers. Lines like Norwegian Cruise Line, Saga, Ambassador, and Fred Olsen. These lines have many solo cabins, they have frequent deals, they have activities, and importantly, the crew and the programs are used to dealing with and addressing kind of the needs of us as solo cruisers. The second group, which are in reality most of the cruise lines, are those that see us as a kind of interesting sideline, but whose main priority remains couples, families, multi-generational travelers. You know, we're a bit of an afterthought. Now, includes lines that I have been on like Celebrity, Holland America, Cunard, Pinot Cruises, Virgin Voyages, Silver Sea, Windstar, Oceania, and Penantin here. You might be surprised about some of those, and I'll come to a little bit later why. Then the third group where I or other solos have felt most out of place are lines which I think actually show very little interest in us. Now, interestingly, the leader in each of the four main cruise categories actually fall into this group. So Carnival Cruise Line in the Mass Resort category, Princess in the premium category, Viking in the small ship luxury, and Seabourn in the ultra luxury. These lines have no solo cabins. They have no to very rare solo promotions. They have limited solo focus on board, certainly in my experience. Now, many people have also told me they believe Royal Caribbean should fall into this group too. But there is another factor that I found does impact my solo experience even more by taking that into account There's another thing that I really need to focus on. After going solo on Classic Ocean, Expedition River, and barge cruises, I feel most comfortable, I realized, when going smaller. This is where I find solo cruising works best. For example, I went on a barge cruise in France on Crossy Europe Deborah. There were just 15 people there, mostly French. They all knew that I was solo from the minute I got on, and they included me in absolutely everything. The same I found also on river cruises. You know, you've got between 100 and 150 people, and it's the same. I found the same to also be true on smaller ocean ships, like Azamara Quest I was on, Oceania Insignia, and Windstar Starbreeze. There are not many people on the ship. They get to know and include me really easily, and it's all without much effort, just because you know each other and you see everybody all around. I feel more and more uncomfortable the bigger and the bigger the ship gets. So for example, on a recent Sky Princess with over 3,600 passengers, mostly couples and families, it was much harder and I felt much more left out to sort of be included and involved. Now importantly, really importantly, on smaller ships, all the crew quickly get to know me, they get to know that I'm traveling solo, and they're not doing that awful thing where crew keep saying in a kind of surprise, judgmental tone, are you by yourself? Is no one joining you? I get a lot of that on bigger ships because of course the crew don't know that you're by yourself. They, they don't recognize and know you because you're just one of many thousands. But with all of that in mind, how though do I find I can cruise cheaper even when doing all of that? Cruise lines almost always make us solos pay the same price as two people because of course they want a certain revenue per cabin. Now, while I must have been on many of my cruises, I still am paying the same as if my partner Mark was coming with me. There are five key things I have found that help me get around or reduce that supplement. I always focus first on trying to get a solar cabin as this is often the best way of getting a lower price. However, I do find I need to plan really far in advance because there are still 
very few of them. In fact, they're so limited that I was able to list all the lines and all the ships with them on my website, tipsfortravelers.com. In doing that list, I spotted three really interesting things which will help as you look for ships. One, it's mostly newer ships or recently renovated ones as cruise lines slowly become more aware that solo travelers uh, like you and I is a big trend. For example, Celebrity used to only have four solo cabins on only one of their older Solstice class ships, the Silhouette. But when their Edge class came in, they've now got between 16 and 24. The same is true on the newer Holland America ships. Even Oceania, a big favorite of mine, they're installing solo cabins right across their fleet. The second thing I noticed is that UK-based cruise lines offer more solo cabins than any other cruise line groups. Lines like Ambassador, they have 89 solo cabins on their ships. Fred Olsen has between 37 and 64. They've added solo cabins onto the ships they bought from Holland America. 20% of Saga Cruises cabins are solo. The third thing I noticed is that the most comprehensive solo cabins offer is still on Norwegian Cruise Line. They have this, what they call solo studios. You have a key card access area, a solo traveler's lounge. Some ships have almost 100 uh, of these. They're pretty small though. They're all inside cabins. They're not actually my idea of fun. Importantly though, when I'm looking at solo cabins, in addition to booking way in advance, I always compare fares with what that line and ship is offering on an ocean view and an inside cabin because they're often still cheaper, even if you're paying a surcharge, than the solo cabin. You know, solo cabins are in high demand, prices shoot up and people focus on them and they don't look at comparing with what other cabins are going for. Now, the next thing that I rely on a lot, probably more than the first one, is I like a balcony cabin. So I constantly look out for low or no solo traveler deals. I sign up for email marketing newsletters for all the cruise lines I'm interested in because that's normally where I found they announce their solo deals and offers. I also ask my travel agent, Sarah Bolton of Travel Counselors to constantly be on the lookout, searching out for solo deals and alert me when they come along. So having travel agents is another good way of doing it. Now I've had really good success with this, especially on luxury and small ship lines. Both of my expedition cruises on Silver Sea had really low solo deals, as was my Panant Antarctica, my Azamara Mediterranean cruise, my Region 7 Seas Caribbean cruise, and an upcoming Windstar Norway Iceland cruise. I find most of these deals happen in what I call the shoulder period, so early and late in the Mediterranean and Caribbean season. So you're talking like March, April time, September, October time, but also the transatlantic repositioning of ships around these times is a great time for solo deals too. Another really good way I find you know, solo deals is going to cruise aggregation sites. So vacations to go.com, they have a solo deal search tab and it shows either really low price cruises, even if you're paying a supplement, but importantly, cruises going at that particular time which have no supplements at all. So that's a good one. Now, if you're UK-based or you want more UK cruises, I find the site passionforcruises.co.uk does pretty much the same thing. I also, by the way, look at solo cruise group trips, though I haven't actually been on one yet. So come back to vacationstogo.com. They run eight to 10 hosted solo cruises every single year. I've signed up for their newsletter. I've joined their Facebook group for these. Now these group cruises have a free roommate match program. If you request a roommate and they can't find you an appropriate match of the same sex and roughly the same age, they will pay the supplement for your stateroom. So you pay just for one person. I also keep an eye on solo travel sites. Now the most interesting one that I've come across is called Singles Travel intel.com. It's a members club for over 50s and as a member of the club, if you become a member of the club, you don't have to be a member of the club, but if you become a member, they give priority on booking any low or no solo offers as they come in. You get first dibs on those. They also, by the way, run group cruises for solos, which include things like a single meet and greet pre-cruise stay, very specific events on board. So that's a great opportunity for solo travelers. Of course, the final way of cracking and breaking that awful surcharge is sharing a cabin with a stranger. It's you know not, not on one of those hosted cruises. It's not for me, but I did find several sites where you can do this. And these include mycabinmate.com, uh, crewmatefinder, and on silversurfer.com. They're 
they're very active with a surprisingly large amount of people looking to share. And in the description of the video, you'll find those links. This leads me to an issue many solo cruisers are really concerned about. How do I cruise without feeling left out or lonely? And how do I make the most of the cruise? I have six key things that I do and that I have to suggest. First of all, go on a theme or a group cruise. Follow your passion. There are theme cruises which focus on everything from, I don't know, Game of Thrones, Star Trek, motorbiking, knitting, and so, so much more. Everybody in the ship is drawn by one key focus, and it's a really great chance for us solo travelers to mix and mingle you know, really, really easily. I'm, for example, also planning to run Tips for Travelers group cruises, so you can sign up for the newsletter if that appeals to you. Second, make friends and plans before you go. The best way I find is using the cruise critic roll call for my cruise. I find the roll call for my cruise and I seek out other solo travelers or like-minded travelers and I find that plans emerge for shared excursions, get together, drinks and so on. Also, by the way, look on Facebook as increasingly I'm finding that someone on the cruise has set up a group to discuss that particular cruise that I'm on. I met recently one of the really loyal followers of the channel, Hetty, and I met a new friend of hers, Yolanda, recently. They were actually both on the Rotterdam at the time. They'd met via online roll calls, and they were part of a group of travelers that were doing Zoom calls to plan events before the trip. Of course, another key thing to do is go to the solo meetup on board, but I find they can be really hit and miss. So I tend to look for other meetups on board that may be a good match for me. So for example, on a recent Queen Mary 2 transatlantic, they had meetups every day or every few days for LGBT travelers, friends of Bill W, crafters, knitters, veterans, Women's Institute, Masonic Brethren, service clubs, Rotary, and on and on and on. And the lines will usually let us you know, set up any informal meetup and advertise it in the daily program to speak to the cruise director. I also suggest going on cruise line excursions, partly because that adds some safety of numbers and a guide, of course, when exploring ports. But I find if I focus on a theme, like for example, in the Caribbean, I always tend to book beach and snorkeling tours. I find the same people are also doing the same excursions time after time. So it's really easy to get to know and start to mix with them. In other regions where I've wanted to do sort of more varied excursions, I book those that are activities like on my recent Norwegian fjords cruise, I booked things like cooking, wide water rafting, hiking, or something I knew would be grouped with others like on RIB boat trips, because this only takes eight or 10 of you. One thing that, that I find an absolute must do as a solo traveler is the onboard activities. They are a great way of connecting. I tend to focus on classes. So if there's classes for cooking, bridge, painting, crafts, dancing, folding towels, whatever, I go because everyone's interacting. Often you're put into groups to work on little projects or stuff. The other thing that I find really great are those activities where you collect points. Now, all the cruises I've been on recently, I could collect points for going to certain activities like shuffleboard, mini golf, and so on. First of all, it's great because I collect the points and I can redeem them for cruise line merchandise at the end. But importantly, I find the same people go to those activities. So I get to make friends, I get to feel part of a group, and I've often then joined them for drinks or dinners or even on excursions or touring the port. Doing them also means that the cruise director and the entertainment team, they get to know that I'm cruising solo. And they often connect me with people, they look out for me, and it's just a really great bonus. People love to talk to strangers on cruises. I'm not particularly chatty or sociable or extroverted on land, but on a cruise, I always talk to people, especially when I'm solo. If I'm sitting, I don't know, in the theater, for example, I turn to the person next to me and simply say something like, are you having a good time? Or something like that. It's always worked out. And again, it's just so much more great because you start to just get friendly faces that you start seeing around the ship. All of this brings me to dining, which I know many uh, people get stressed about when solo cruising. Now, I've traveled for years for business before I did this, and I was used to dining by myself. And in fact, I like to dine solo. In fact, I find getting to dine at a table by myself is harder on a cruise than dining with others on many lines. It's much harder to get a table for yourself. Anyway, when it comes to dining, when cruising solo, I think there's two key approaches, and I use both of these. First of all, 
With the main dining room, if I want certainty and I want familiarity on a cruise, I go for a fixed dining time and I ask for a table of six or more people. That means I can get to know people well, there's enough people at the table, so if I click with some more than others, I can rotate around who I sit with each night. Importantly then, I have the same serving staff who know I'm solo, they build a rapport, and they make you feel welcome. They're really good at doing that as they get to know you. I always go for that bigger table because I found the most difficult times traveling solos where I've been put on a table perhaps with one other couple once, or two couples and me, and, it, and you basically kind of feel the odd one out. Cruise lines, of course, often put solo travelers together, or importantly, travelers they think may be a good match based on age, for example. However, if I think on a cruise, I actually want to meet as many people as possible and see where it all goes, I then go for any time dining. It's way more hit and miss in my experience, but I figure I'm seeing people for one meal, and so I can move on if some don't work out. It also allows much more flexibility because I can then arrange it down with people I've met on excursions or on those activities. So that's a big plus. Now with speciality dining though, I always book to sit by myself and find I often have to go early, get an early booking to do that. I don't like sharing at speciality dining because many people go to them for a treat or a special occasion and I kind of feel more uncomfortable because you just feel you're intruding a bit more. Another thing that I like on smaller and ultra luxury lines is they also welcome, always encourage you to ask a member of the entertainment team, you know, the singers or the dancers, to dine with me, and they all love to do that. So as a solo traveler, I recommend trying and seeing if that works for you. If you found all of this interesting, why not find out more about the lines to avoid cruising right now by watching this video, where I start with my biggest regret of line and why. See you over there.